Genesis chapter 11. We're going to begin reading at the 10th verse. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 10. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the word of God. These are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Apakshad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he fathered Apakshad 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Apakshad had lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah. And Apakshad lived after he fathered Shelah 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. And Shelah lived after he fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Eber lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Ru. And Peleg lived after he fathered Ru 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Ru had lived 32 years, he fathered Sarug. And Ru lived after he fathered Sarug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sarug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor. And Sarug lived after he fathered Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. And Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren, she had no child. Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Let's pray together. Lord, unveil your word to us. Teach us its truth. We recognize we're blind and cannot see unless you give us eyes. We're deaf and cannot hear unless you give us ears. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. Pray in Christ's name. Amen. This amazing passage before us is... God breathed scripture, and anyone who is an author knows something about the start of a book. It's vital to capture people's attention at the very beginning. The first words you write, the first sentence, the first paragraph must be gripping. You have to give the reader the opportunity and the desire to read more than the first sentence, the first paragraph, and so you've got to get people's attention. If you go to the New Testament for a moment, please go to the book of Matthew. Matthew is the start of the New Testament, of course, and I want us to read the opening words there. Matthew chapter 1. You see, an introduction must give the reader reason to keep on reading or else it's all over. And here's how the New Testament starts. Are you ready? Here we go. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Did you catch that? That's the very first sentence in the New Testament. But it gets better. Let's read verse 2. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, 
and Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram. If that's not captured your attention, read verse 4. And Ram, the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. And so we could go on. Oh, let's go to verse 15. And Eliud, the father of Eliezer, and Eliezer, the father of Matan, and Matan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called Christ. I've shared once before, but it bears repeating. I was once in a service where I heard the testimony of a man who was born and raised in India, and he was giving his testimony of conversion to Christ, and he had traveled outside of India and found himself in a hotel room and opened one of the drawers and found one of the Gideon Bibles that oftentimes you might see, except it was simply a New Testament. And so he started reading. He knew it was a Christian book, and he thought, well, let's give it a shot. And he read Matthew chapter 1, and he read the genealogy. And he said, you might think that this is a kind of a boring thing. If you're reading through a Bible, you often skip through the genealogical records and the chronologies. He says, but that was the most dramatic passage I'd ever read in my life. And he said, it might amaze you, but I was converted on the spot in that hotel room. And I was thinking, why? (laughs) Uh, Why exactly would that be? I mean, this wasn't John 3.16. This was Matthew 1 and the first opening verses. He was converted down on his knees, crying out to God and looking to Jesus Christ for salvation. Here he was years later recounting the story. And he said, you need to understand from my perspective, this was the most dramatic, jaw-dropping, spectacular beginning to the book or any book I've ever read. And he was sincere. He was converted on the spot. You see, all he had known were gurus who perhaps lived in the next village or eight villages away who came out of nowhere. They arose out of nowhere. No one was interested in their genealogy. Some child who was the enlightened one, so-called, perhaps, deemed to know enlightening things. You go to them for information from the guru. But none of them had any kind of ancestry. They couldn't say, my father was this and he was significant. They just simply appeared out of nowhere. Here in Matthew 1, in contrast, was a man who could trace his heritage over centuries and even millennia, and thereby prove himself to be the long-awaited Messiah. If you're in Matthew, turn to the right and go to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, where early on in the Gospel of Luke, we have another You guessed it, genealogy. Look at verse 34. Jumping into this genealogy, verse 34. The son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Sarug, the son of Ru, the son of Pereg. Does that sound familiar? Do these names sound familiar? The son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. It's amazing. What we see in the big picture of Genesis 11, if you begin turning back there, is this fact. God is in charge of human history. He's bringing about his purpose and his purposes, and he's always doing that. And what we have in Genesis 11 is an early account of what will prove to be the lineage of the Messiah, the line of the Messiah in redemptive history. It does read a little bit like a phone book, Are there even such things in our day? Do they even have phone books? People are looking, you know, under the age of 30, what's a phone book? But uh, there it is. The 10,000 feet above looking down view of Genesis 11 is stunning. God is in charge of human history. He really is in charge. He really is working out his purposes. This was written around 1400 years BC by Moses. And the big picture here is of God calling people out of darkness 
into his marvelous light. These are familiar words found in 1 Peter chapter 2. He's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We've already seen in Genesis 3 that the one who's coming will be the seed of the woman, an unusual phrase fulfilled in the virgin birth of Christ. The seed of Abraham, Genesis 17. The seed of Isaac, Genesis 21. The seed of David, you could read many scriptures, Psalm 132. The offspring of a virgin, Isaiah chapter 7. In a place he'll be born, Bethlehem, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Again, God is sovereign, nothing random, nothing left to chance. I want to ask you today, do you believe that? Do you believe that nothing is left to chance? Because that's the message of the Bible. The big picture is God achieving all his objectives. And the application for you and me is you're not here by chance. You're not here on planet Earth by chance. Well, you need to understand the story. You can talk with details about the story, and I'll listen. I'll be very happy to listen to your story, but at the end of it, I'll say, and you're still not here by chance. You're not a cosmic accident. God is not surprised you showed up and now has to think, now what can we do with this guy? What can we do with this girl? No, you're here because God decided you would be here, and he decided long before there was any thing. You're here by sovereign designation, sovereign decree. You might say, but it it was just fortuitous that my mother went ahead with the birth of the baby, and I'm the baby, Yeah, and and God was behind it all. Uh, You're not going to convince me otherwise, because I've read my Bible, and this is God's revelation. He's in charge of history. And God is not at any point in history saying, I wish things were different. I so wish... Pharaoh hadn't come and ruined my plans and this guy did this and Nebuchadnezzar did that. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar was the first person to pray the Lord's Prayer, except he got it wrong with just one word. Mine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And God says, "Uh, really? Well, you understand I'll never mess with free will, so I'm going to leave you to your devices. No, he says, "Uh, you're really in charge, are you? I'm going to mess with your will. You've got no will to act like an animal, but that's the way you're going to be as from now. Boom. And he's in charge. That's how much. And at the end of it all, uh, when people were asking, where's the king? Oh, he's grazing in the palace grounds. God restored the man's sanity, and he sent out a tract, the first tract in history, saying the God who truly is, is not me, and he reigns over everything. You read Daniel 4. That's it. There's not a little verse here or a little verse there. This is the entire scope and message of our Bible. God is sovereign. Get used to it. He's not sovereign if that's okay with you. He's sovereign whether you and I accept it or not. He is ruling on the nation, over the nations. There's a friend of mine called uh, Pastor Jim Osman. He's currently writing a book, and he's keeping me up to date on it. It should be out in spring of next year. It's got a great title called God Doesn't Try. He's not trying. Oh, I, I really tried with that guy, didn't I? Didn't you see me try? No, the God of the Bible says, this is what I will do, and he gets it done all the time. Every time. My purpose will stand. Nothing can stand in the way of our God. So I'm encouraging Jim Osmond, write that book, please. When, when's it coming out? I love the title, God Doesn't Try. He's not trying to speak. He has spoken. He's not trying to build his church. Jesus said, I will build my church. He is not hoping that things work out. His will will come to pass. Ephesians 1 verse 11 says he works all things according to the counsel of his will. But there's a devil. Yeah, and even the devil is God's devil. But man has a will and God overrides it. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he, that's God, turns it wherever he wishes. If that's true of the king and the palace, it's true of everybody else in the nation. That's God. That's the God with whom we have to deal with. The promise and, uh, of God being in charge is not that one day he will you know, sort things out. He's in charge right now. 
He will work things out, but he's working things out now. So God is not attempting to do anything. He's not trying. What he decrees, he does. He's never frustrated. He's not going to be frustrated in eternity, whereby he says, look, I really tried, guys. You saw it. No, he will achieve everything he sets out and set out to achieve. I mentioned Pharaoh. Think of the rise of Egypt and therefore the rise of Pharaoh, a dominating world power, an oppressor of God's people Israel. Let me just read, no need to turn there, the New Testament commentary on this. God speaking to Pharaoh. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up. Oh, I, I, I thought Egypt rose by itself and Pharaoh rose by himself. And no, God says, I'm behind all that. Underneath all of that, there's me. I have raised you up for this purpose that I might show my power in you. Now, in this case, it wasn't that Pharaoh was going to be an evangelist for the good news of Yahweh. No, God was going to show his power in Pharaoh when he did him in in the Red Sea. That I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So I'm not just watching you be raised up. I take the blame for the raising up of you, Pharaoh. And I did it to show my power so that when I do you in, all your might will be seen as nothing to my power, my authority, my sovereignty. We have the Pharaoh hardening his heart, and God said, I harden your heart also. One of the ways we understand that is not that God in, in, injects fresh evil into the heart, but leaves man to his own stubborn free will. I think that's what takes place there. God brought about his purpose, not having mercy on him, but hardening him, leaving him to his own devices. And that's, we've quoted Romans nine seventeen verse 18 says as a, Kind of summary, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. I'm taking a breath because that's big stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, that's big stuff. But I submit to you, that's the God of the Bible, the only God there is. There isn't another one. You don't like this one. Oh, there's God B, there's God C. No, everything else is idolatry. This is the only God that there is. And all through Genesis 11, if we've gone back there, we're reading of a God who's getting his will done and he's preserving a remnant. Martin Luther, let me quote him, lest we suppose that Satan has been allowed to remove the sunlight of the word from the world and to suppress the church, the generation of the Holy Fathers is set before us to show us that the mercy of God, by the mercy of God, the remnants were preserved and the church was not completely wiped out. The Bible speaks of God's people, Israel, as the church in the wilderness. God has only ever had one people, those that know him. As we're in Genesis, I want to remind you of something we've gone over a number of times. It's divided into what we call 11 sections, marked by a Hebrew term, Tolidoth, and it means account or generations, Tolidoth, and there are 11 of them found in the book of Genesis. This is kind of a self-devised frame of reference to show the sections of the book. And we're in Genesis chapter 11, and it begins with one of those Toledos. In our English standard version, it reads in verse 10, these are the generations of Shem. We've seen this before in chapter 2, verse 4, chapter 5, verse 1, chapter 6, Verse 9, chapter 10, verse 1. Chapter 11, verse 10 is the one we're looking at now. There's another one before we finish the chapter. Look at verse 27. These are the generations. Again, a Toledoth of Terah. And then there's 14 chapters without any. We find it again in chapter 25, where we find it in verse 12 and verse 19. And verse 10, as we go back to Genesis 11, verse 10, these are the generations, the Toledoth of Shem. And that's where God is focusing his attention. This is not a, an exhaustive list of everyone who could be listed. God's focus is on his redemptive work in history. And that's why the lens kind of narrows and we now have Shem in full focus. Because that's where God is going to do his greatest work. Redemptive 
history. That's what we have in our Bible. It's not a record of everything that ever happened to the Chinese or this language group or everything that ever happened in the world. It's a record of God's dealings with men. It's redemptive history, but let me say this. It's redemptive history. It's true. It is what happened. And God is not recounting to us all the events of human history, but focusing on his special dealings in redemption. We know this in our ancient past, in the last couple of hundred years here in the States, as something called providence. People used to talk about that. People used to mention that word. Even towns and cities were named Providence, Providence Road, Island, and so on. Because there was a recognition of this concept that we seem to have lost in our day. But as we read our Bibles, that concept, though you might not see the word providence, you do see God providing, the Lord our provider. And it's a very biblical concept, and we need to grasp it again. That's what we're seeing in Genesis 11 in the big picture. Verse 10 again, these are the generations of Shem. Shem was, of course, one of the three sons of Noah and becomes the focus of attention rather than his brothers. And what this passage does is takes us from Shem all the way to Abraham. And as we've seen in Matthew and in Luke, these are significant things we need to absorb. Then it goes on, when Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Apakshad two years after the flood. Verse 11, and Shem lived after he fathered Apakshad 500 years and had other sons and daughters. Now, there's three things worth really pointing out here. One, this is not an exhaustive list of names. Look at that phrase. He had other sons and daughters, verse 11. So they are not mentioned, but they are uh, not mentioned by name anyway, but they are certainly in view. Second, you'll see that the lifespan of man is now decreasing, diminishing. We've already seen Methuselah, who was the longest person ever to live. The unusual name he had meant, after he dies, when he dies, it shall happen. And the year in which he died was, of course, the flood. But the years, the lifespans are diminishing, and that will become more and more apparent as we go through the passage here. And thirdly, a thing worth pointing out is the age of a father. When the first child is born, that age gets lower and lower. It started off in the hundreds of years. When he was 2,000 years old, no. When he was 200 years old, he had a child, and now it comes down to 35, 32, 30. It's very, very different. Let's look at verse 12. When Apakshad had lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah, and Apakshad lived after he fathered Shelah 403 years, and had other sons and daughters. What have you got to say about that? Um, not too much. Verse 14. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. Here I'll stop and I'll point out that name, Eber, is significant because from that name in the original language comes the term Hebrew. Again, very, very interesting. That's the earliest form of our modern day word Hebrew. Verse 15, and Sheila lived after he fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Eber lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. Peleg lived 30 years. Notice that. 30, 30 years, verse uh, 14. Um, 30 years, verse 18. He fathered Ru. Peleg lived after he fathered Ru 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Ru had lived 32 years, he fathered Sarug. And Ru lived after he fathered Sarug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sarug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor. And Sarug lived after he fathered Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. Now, here we really need to focus this name is very significant, as he would become the father of Abraham, later to be called Abraham. And God is going to make a covenant with Abraham, hugely significant in our Bibles. Through Abraham, he's going to bless all the nations. 
So that in Galatians chapter 3, it says, if you have faith in Jesus, then you are sons of Abraham. You share in the promise. You're part of what God intended even all those years ago. Verse 25, and Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now, I mentioned it's significant about Terah. Why is it significant? Well, some of his background needs to be understood. He was a pagan idolater and gave birth with his wife to Abraham. In other words, Abraham was born and raised in a very pagan environment. Some of you can relate to that. But it was no problem for God because when God calls someone, he calls them out of darkness. And God is not in any way threatened by the measure or the level of darkness. When light comes on, darkness goes away. You might have a building that you might have bought. Let's go in your imagination. You buy a building, it's not been opened in 10 years. It's had 10 years of darkness, no electricity turned on, dark as dark can be, and with one flick of the switch, lights come on, all the darkness goes. The Bible says the entrance of his word brings light. So many of us are intimidated by the darkness. We're intimidated by the measure of darkness in our families. Just recognize when God brings his light, darkness goes. And that's what happened with Abraham. He lived in a culture of darkness, raised as a pagan in a godless environment. That family was devoted to moon worship. God wasn't threatened. Babel, or Babel, meant that sin was now being scattered. Idolatry was now not just in one place, but broad throughout the world, the the then no world. And as you remember, and as we then go on to read in chapter 12, God spoke to Abraham, go from your country, from your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. Look at verse 27. These are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. It's interesting that name means princess. And the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Isker. Now look at verse 30. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. There was no likelihood that Abraham would become what he was going to become because of God. It was a seemingly impossible situation. There was no evangelist out doing tent crusades. No one handing out tracts. But it was no issue to God. It's as if he tapped him on the shoulder and says, I'm God. Whoa, life-changing event. You might come from a very impossible situation, but again, I don't believe you're here on planet Earth by chance, and I don't believe you're here in this service by chance, listening to these words by chance. Just happen to stumble on this in the, on the internet, or else you're here stumbling in, thinking, what am I here for? Why am I here? God has tapped you on the shoulder and is speaking to you. And that is the revelation of what is known as the church. We know this technically. The word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia, comprised of two Greek words, ek. We have the word exit. I see that sign here. It comes from the Greek. It means the way out. If you're thinking, how do I get out of here? You follow the exits, the way out, ek, exit, way out. And the word kaleo, which means to call. And so the ecclesia are the ecclesia, the ones who are called out. There's a mass of humanity. And God, knowing that he's chosen a people for himself before eternity began, doesn't look down the corridor of time and wait for us to make a choice. The reason for that is if he did, all he would see would be us shaking our fists at God. We don't love him. We don't want him. God has to actually call us and in that call, give us a new heart. And so God 
let's say he's coming for you. Your name is Melanie. Your name is George. There's a moment in time when God calls you effectively to himself. And he says, Melanie, out, I say. And you come out of darkness into his marvelous light. And eight seconds before, you didn't want the true God. Now you do. How do you explain that? Was it the music? Was it the smile of one of the ushers? What, what was it? Did, did we get the right atmosphere? Did, did the preacher just get his timing right? What was it? Did we create the right mood? No. God spoke. And the attending Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, invaded your heart and turned the lights on. People say, oh, you've seen the light, have you? Yes, we've seen the light. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It's just as much a dramatic thing as creation. The same God who said, let there be light, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the glory of Jesus Christ. The glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God, at a certain moment in your life, you may have been four years old and unaware of it and can't even locate the time. For others, it was a definite immediate event. You can even put the date on the calendar. Some say, I, uh, somewhere in between the age of five and eight, I came to Christ. And, but understand this, there was a moment when God invaded your space and took out the heart of stone and called you out of darkness and said, you will be mine today. You've resisted and I have overcome your resistance. I'm making Jesus immensely attractive to you. And you didn't want him before. Some of you have come to Christ the first time you heard it, but that's kind of rare, it being the gospel. Others have heard the gospel 38 times, and it was that 39th time that God says, this is the day you're coming home. Out, I say, out, Melanie, out, George. And you come out from the broad masses of the people into the church. You're called out. That's the nature of what the church is, the called out ones. Many of you are praying for family members. And we give them the word of God because that's the means by which people come. Some people have the mistaken idea, we don't need to preach, we don't need to share the gospel because if they're elect, they'll come. No, the means by which they come is the hearing of the word of God. And we need to be about the means. Fathers need to teach their children, Deuteronomy 7. You don't know the end result of all that will take place, but you are responsible and those two things coincide. We're responsible and God is sovereign. Can you explain that, Pastor? No, no idea. But those two concepts are certainly taught in Scripture. We're entirely responsible for our responsibility. And the word responsible has two words in it, response and able. We are able to respond, and yet... Our ability to respond is within certain measures. We can respond in certain ways. But one response we won't ever do is say yes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ until God, though we are responsible to say yes, until God takes out the heart of stone. So hearts of stone don't want transplants. We're not signing up. Give us a new heart. The fact that you want one is probably evidence that you've already got one. Moving right along. So many of you are facing heartbreaking situations, but the hope is not in the preacher's eloquence or your ability to answer questions, though we would work hard to be good at both. It's God who opens the eyes of the blind, causing them to see. And that act is much more significant than any temporal ministry, any temporal miracle. The taking out of, out of a heart of stone so that you become a new person. So that we can say if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. I've got new desires. I want the Bible. I didn't want it before. I want the true God. Didn't want him before. Why do I want truth? Because the God of truth has given you light. What we see from verse 27 onwards is the story from Terah to Abraham. You'll notice too that 
We have a difference in chapter 11 from previous chapters because before that we have, and he died, and he died, and he died. There's a name of person, and he died. And then this guy, he lived, and then he died. What we have in chapter 11 is verse 11 onwards, uh, Shem lived, and Arphaxad lived. Verse 12 and verse 13, Afak said lived. And so we have this new creation after the flood of God reforming and repopulating. And he's doing it now with this family. This place uh, was a center for idolatry. And that's where Abraham comes from. Sarah was named after the moon goddess. means princess. Look at verse 30. Sarah was barren and had no child. It seems that God loves taking on a challenge. If he's going to bless the nations, rather than start with someone who's young, he starts with someone who's old, more than that barren, more than that has no children. What's he got to work with? One man said it this way. God can do a lot with a little. He can do everything with nothing. One of the testimonies I can share with you is that the most stunned people on planet Earth when they heard me preach later on in life were my aunts, A-U-N-T-S. They'd seen me as a child not speaking. They said, it's a a miracle. They went around the house for three days. It's a miracle. We could not get a word out of you. I was locked up emotionally. And I know more than anyone else, whatever happens through my lips, it's God at work because I couldn't do it. I had no ability my, I, I talked with my feet. I was a soccer player. So just in a limited way, I can understand something of this. Some of you have that same testimony that you're doing what you couldn't do but God. God gave you your singing gift. God gave you your ability to write. God gave you your ability to draw, whatever it might be. Your ability to sell, whatever it might be. Give God the credit. It's a gift. Why should a host pipe tra- take any uh, glory from the fact that wonderful, beautiful water is flowing through it? It's just a host pipe. And we're earthen vessels. And Abraham and Sarai were earthen vessels. No children, impossible to have children. God says, that's a challenge. <laughs> Nothing's beyond him. He's an extremist. He really is. God chooses unlikely candidates. The big Mo, oh yeah, he's got it all. He he doesn't think he's got it all. When God finally says, now it's time for you to be the leader of the nation, Moses says, you got the wrong guy. Can you use Aaron? God's got this habit of using people who don't think they can do it. A lot of times people say, you, you know, you, you, you're thinking about me as, a, as, a, as an elder. I, 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 I could never do it. Oh, wow. You better watch it. God's looking at you with a lot of interest now. You don't think you can do it? That's his challenge. Whatever he might call you to do. Let's go in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 for a moment. There are some that God calls who have great ability. I need to say that. There are some who have great intellectual ability. People like Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a tremendous preacher of the last century, and he was a doctor before he was ever a preacher. He had great natural ability. That would be true of the Apostle Paul as well, a great intellect. He had several doctorates in, in terms of what we would describe in our own day while he was still in his early 20s. He was just... Amaze, amazingly qualified. But that's not always the case. In fact, usually it's, it's not the case. Look at verse 26. Well, for the sake of contrast, let's go to verse 22. For Jews demand signs and Greeks wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Paul knew what people wanted, and he was going to preach God's message regardless. They wanted signs, they wanted wisdom. He was going to preach the cross. And if we understand it, the cross is the true sign and the cross is true wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, and look at this, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. Paul knew what was going to happen when he preached. 
wasn't going to be accepted by many. He wasn't going to change the message, though. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. Here's verse 26. For consider your calling. When God called you, what kind of state were you in? For consider your calling, brothers, not many. Now notice he didn't say not any, but he did say not many. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But then we're going to come across a phrase that is repeated. When God says it once, that should get our attention. But when he repeats things over and over and over, it should really rattle our cage. But God chose, look at that. God chose what is foolish in the world. Why did God choose me? Well, it could be because you were foolish. (laughs) According to worldly standards. Why? To shame the wise. Because all of the intellectuals out there climbing the mountain of knowledge start off in the wrong place, end up in the wrong place, and they never get to God. But God, seeing foolish people according to worldly standards, says, you know what? I'm going to get more glory by revealing myself to the nobodies than if I reveal myself to the somebodies. There are some somebodies I'll call, but most of them are foolish according to worldly standards. Why? To shame the wise. Because in Christ you have true wisdom, ultimate wisdom, infinite wisdom, and the world with its intellectual prowess never gets there. In Christ is all the fullness of wisdom and revelation according to Colossians. Not many of you were wise. Who's the you? The people at Corinth. This is true not only of the church at Corinth, but the church throughout the world, and I think even through time. God is in the habit of calling many who are not wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many, not all, but not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised. This is God's activity in the world. It's not like he just throws it all open and hopes someone will respond. No, he he chose and he called. And the cross will not make sense to Jews or Gentiles, except it will to the called who are of Gentile birth and of Jewish birth. God calls the people out from the Jews, calls them out from the Gentiles, and makes the people the people of God. Verse 28, God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. Why? How? He does it by his power. Well, yeah, I understand, but at least I got myself into this. Uh, Jesus, uh, he he offered himself, and I chose. I I said yes, and I got myself in, Pastor. Uh, No, that's corrected. That thought's corrected in verse 30. And because of him, you're in Christ Jesus. God got you in by his powerful call, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that... As it's written, let the one who boasts, boast in who? The Lord. Back to Genesis chapter 11. Let's begin to wrap this up. What's your situation? Are you unlikely to succeed? God says, uh, if I'm for you, who can be against you? Uh, But I've got a lot of enemies. If God is for you, or since God is for you now as a Christian, who can be against you? Then we read verse 31, Terah took Abram his son and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarah his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Canaan, excuse me, when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. Final scripture I'd like us to go to is Acts chapter 7. I would love to see the New Testament commentary on this period as Abraham is mentioned here. That's where this genealogy is taking us from Shem to Abraham. Acts chapter 7, and if you want a great history of the people of God, go to this speech of Stephen. 
in Acts chapter 7, where he recounts the history of Israel. And by the way, it's the last thing he does. He's martyred as the first Christian martyr for recounting what he does in this chapter. Acts chapter 7, look at verse 1. And the high priest said, are these things so? We won't go into all the background. Verse 2, and Stephen said, brothers and fathers, hear me. He's he's speaking there, brothers in the sense, and fathers in the sense of elders in Israel and brothers in Israel. They were not spiritually uh, conditioned as fathers and brothers, as we will see. Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran and said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you're now living. That's the commentary. What is the commentary? It looked bleak. It looked like it was over. There was no hope seemingly except the God of glory appeared to Abraham. Without warning, didn't give a two-minute warning, just suddenly appeared. And should you be a Christian, a true Christian, do you realize God has done the same for you? You might not have seen something with earthly eyes, but God has opened up your heart to see the Christ as he truly is. And he called you out, out from the world, into the church. What we read is also unsettling in some ways because it wasn't Terah who was called out, but Abraham. Not everybody in Abraham's family was affected the same way. As far as we know, Terah died in unbelief in his pagan idolatry and died as a lost man. Abraham instead was converted. We see that in Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed the Lord and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And what we see is not an immediate obedience on his part, but a partial obedience. And perhaps that can be true of some of us as we move out from the world and we're still struggling to uh, go all the way with God because we've got these relationships and they hem us in and they keep us where we shouldn't be. But if you hear the sound of the voice of the Holy Spirit, follow him, follow the ways of truth, follow Christ. And they settled there, where in the place that was idolatrous, maybe they felt at home, we don't know, but perhaps that's the case. And there was seemingly a process of obedience in Abraham's life. But Terah died in Haran, in his paganism. How do we come out by the work of the Holy Spirit? But what means does he use? The means he uses is the gospel. Pastor John, could you sum up the gospel? I'd be glad to. It's a privilege to do that. The triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, the only God there is. With an eternal love for one another, the Father loving the Son, the Son loving the Father, the Son loving the Spirit, the Spirit loving the other two members of the Godhead, announced in creation in chapter 1 of Genesis, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and man was made in the image of God, responsible to worship only him, to obey only him, but instead of that, They obeyed the serpent in the garden and they, instead of rising, fell and all mankind fell with him. That rebellion is born in the heart of us all. It's explained in the book of Romans chapter 5. In Adam we die, in Christ we're made alive, 1 Corinthians 15. And born of Adam we have a rebellious sin nature. More than that, we commit rebellious acts called sin and God has every right to wipe us out forever. But God in his love so loved this world when he didn't have to. He sent his son, the second person of the Trinity, into the world. And this was his plan all along, that his son would come to the world and live a righteous life, being born of a virgin, and then going to a cruel, rugged, brutal cross to die in the place of sinners. 
And on the cross, God laid on him the sin of all God's people through the ages. And he bore our punishment for us there. But that was not the end of the story. He died, but he also rose again from the dead three days later. And is now at the place of all authority in this universe so that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He hasn't made it difficult. It's just impossible for the natural man. And under the sound of the word... God creates human hearts, not in everyone, but in those the Father has chosen, that the Son has died for. Then the Holy Spirit applies that redemption to the heart by taking out the stone of the heart, the heart of stone, and putting in a, a, a beating heart that wants to know God, and suddenly we want what we didn't want before. Has that happened with you? Have you come to him? Have you repented? Have you believed in this Christ? The one whom we read earlier in the service, there were those who who saw him and said, now I can die in peace. I've seen the Lord's Christ. Have you seen him with spiritual eyes? Have you come to him? Have you understood the great gospel good news? And if you have, where are you on the path of obedience? Could it be that the Lord is calling you and there's something in his word you still have yet to obey? Let me call you to that obedience. Obey the Son. Obey by the means of his word. Come under the sound of his word and let, as you hear it, come under his governments and that means coming under his kingly reign. That's the kingdom of God in operation today, to come under the rule of the king. Have you done it? Recognizing this, your life was planned by God with its highs, with its lows, with its peaks, with its valleys, so that at this moment you would hear this stunning, amazing news of a God who even through genealogies is working out his purposes so that you have a part to play in history. May you be part of redemption and not the opposite of that. May you be saved as you come under the kingly reign of Jesus repenting and believing in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this revelation of truth found in the opening chapters of this amazing first book of our Bibles. May we live in the good of it, serving the true king of this age and the age to come, the one who forever will reign, the one who forever is on the throne, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, whose name is is Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.